Hey, this is Bailey. And I'm Timothy. And welcome to What Sleep Podcast. Let's get right into it. So, Hi. welcome to part two of the one and only Ted Bundy. Yep, let's do it. <laughs> if you missed the first episode, highly recommend that you go back and listen to that. You'll be confused. Might be a little confused, but to kind of sum up what we talked about previously, we went over some of his Utah, Colorado, and Washington murders as well. Mm-hmm. Of, and Oregon. You know, and Oregon, yep. yes. Um, and kind of his earlier life, you know and just things like that so definitely go check that out before continuing with this episode but let's get on with this one do it part two so in this one we're gonna go ahead and start off with his arrest first trial and his escapes (laughs) okay (laughs) so on august 16th of 1975 in salt lake city ted bundy was arrested for failure to stop for a police officer how how are you out here murdering people and not being careful around police enough just to not get stopped by one for a traffic violation he's gotten away with it for how long he kind of built a confidence in it i guess stupid so it's just like a daily like life thing for him now is uh, i'm also a murderer like casually what are your hobbies (laughs) not murder i'll tell you that (laughs) video games facts so the police did end up searching his car and during this search they found a ski mask a crowbar handcuffs, trash bags, an ice pick, and other items that were thought by the police to be burglary tools. Uh, That's like a, it's like a murderer's kit, a murder kit, basically. How to murder 101. Here's a a kit. It's a little, a little suspicious, you know. But Bundy remained calm uh, during questioning, explained that he needed the mask for skiing and had found the handcuffs in a dumpster. Okay, sure. (laughs) Utah detective Jerry Thompson connected Bundy and his Volkswagen to the Durant murder er, kidnapping and the missing girls and searched his apartment. Good. The search uncovered a brochure of Colorado ski resorts with a check mark by the Wildwood Inn where Karen Campbell had disappeared. Oh, really? After searching his apartment, the police brought Bundy in for a lineup before Durant and the uh, bountiful witnesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, because they, there were. Yeah, there were a <laughs> lot of witnesses. Uh, they did identify him as Officer Roseland, who was apparently an alias oh, he was yeah. going by when he was pretending to be a police I remember officer. remember that. He was... As well as being the man lurking about the night Debbie Kent disappeared. Mm-hmm. And I actually do have a picture of the lineup that he was identified in. Oh, I'm curious. Hold on. I gotta walk over. Do you know which one it is? Yeah, it's right here. Yeah. <laughs> he looks so scary. He looks mad. Um, I don't know if he's like doing something with his face, but I he think looks he, I like think he's trying to look serious. I don't, I don't know. He's like, he looks like he's thinking way too hard. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the picture of him that he was identified from. Okay. Following a week-long trial, Bundy was convicted of Durant's kidnapping on March first, nineteen seventy-six, and was sentenced to fifteen years in Utah State Prison. Colorado authorities were pursuing murder charges, however, and Bundy was extradited there to stand trial. Okay. You think, hey, <laughs> this is where it ends, right? That's, I mean, that's where it's supposed to end. Nope. We know what happens. <laughs> On June 7th, 1977, in preparation for a hearing in the Karen Campbell murder trial, Bundy was taken to the Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen. During a court recess, he was allowed to visit the courthouse's law library, where he jumped out the building from the second story window and escaped. I... It's just so funny that that's how he got out. Right. But also, are you kidding me? I also find it funny that he uh, did sprain his right ankle during the jump. Right, yeah. But so. how do you how do you just let that happen? How was nobody in the room with him? You know what I mean? Yeah, like you're charging him on murder. Murder. After murder. He, you just convicted him of kidnapping. Right. 
And you just casually, like, yeah, you can go in the library that has an open window. An open window. It, on only the, it was second floor. It was second, it was second floor. Second floor, so, like, very escapable. Not easily. I mean, granted, yeah, you, you know. But. He did hurt himself, but. Right. He still got away. <laughs> still got away. And the weird thing, too, is, like, after he escaped, like, he just started strolling casually through the small town toward aspen mountain yeah just casually well, walking around like nothing happened I would, just, I would imagine that maybe he tried to not raise suspicion because i mean if you're running with a limp you know yeah people are gonna recognize you i, I mean not at first maybe you know but yeah i saw this guy that's now in the newspaper for getting away and he was heading this direction so yeah. maybe you know well, or maybe it hurt to walk. <laughs> he did manage to make it all the way to the top of Aspen Mountain without being detected. He did stop to uh, rest for a couple of days in an abandoned hunting cabin. Mm-hmm. It's crazy that he got all that, you know, right. all that way. Like all that way with a limp. Busted ankle. You can't yeah. really go to the hospital oh, for yeah. that. <laughs> I busted my ankle. Sorry, what's your name? <laughs> right. Um, but afterwards, he lost his sense of direction and wandered around the mountain, missing two trails that led down off the mountain to his intended destination, the town of Crested. That's a me move. Crest- I would get lost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the Crested Butt. Butte? Butte. Is it B-U-T-T-E. Butte. I'm here for you. <laughs> Thanks, man. Ignore me. I'm just... You can redo that. I'll take it. Nah, it's fine. No, people are going to be mad. <laughs> I don't care. Let them. <laughs> At this point, I'm tired. At one point, he came face to face with a gun-toting citizen who was one of the searchers scouring Aspen Mountain for Ted Bundy, but talked his way out of danger. Wow. I have the gun, sir. I have the gun, but he has the power of words. Yep. On June 13th, 1977, Bundy stole a car he found on the mountain. Okay. He drove back into Aspen and could have gotten away, but Why? two police deputies noticed a Cadillac with dim headlights weaving in and out of its lane and pulled Bundy over. Why would he over. go back to Aspen? Why? You're smarter than this. Well, my thing I'm is, glad uh, clearly he, not. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad he did because I'm he he got caught. But like, come on. <laughs> The fact that you got away with it, stole a car, all this stuff, and right. then you get pulled over for weaving you in and out of a lane. Escaped. And then the cops recognized him and, and took him back to jail. You're so dumb. Yeah. So he was back in custody, but Bundy worked on a new escape plan. He was being held in the Glenwood Springs, Colorado jail while he awaited trial. He had acquired a hacksaw blade and $500 in cash. He later... Uh, claim the blade came from another prison inmate. Sure it did. Right. Uh, I mean, maybe, I don't know. But <laughs> Over two weeks, he sawed through the welds, fixing a small metal plate in the ceiling, and after dieting down still further, was able to fit through the hole and access the crawl space above. Uh, an informant in the prison told guards that he had heard Bundy moving around the ceiling during the nights before his escape. Uh, but the did matter- he not check that out? They, they, he just didn't check it out they didn't investigate it okay. at all they were just like yeah you're crazy all right. whatever okay <laughs> when bundy's aspen trial judge ruled on december 23rd 1977 that the karen campbell murder trial would start on january 9th 1978 uh, and change the venue to colorado springs bundy realized that he had to make his escape before he was transferred out of the glenwood springs mm-hmm. prison on the night of... Did all that work to get out of it. You better... Right. Might as well make advantage of it. <laughs> right. On the night of December 30th, 1977, Bundy dressed warmly and packed books and files under his blanket to make it look like he was sleeping. He wriggled through the hole and up into the crawl space. Bundy crawled over to a spot directly above the jailer's linen closet. Mm-hmm. The jailer and his wife were out for the evening. And he dropped down into the jailer's apartment and walked out the door. Bold. I, th- that's amazing. But, like... Not like, good job him, but like, what circumstances to be in, you know? Oh, yeah, just... While making a prison escape as a murderer. They just weren't home, and you walk right through their front door where they live. Are you kidding? Fun stuff, right? I hate it. So, Bundy it was, was so free. easy for him. I know. <laughs> like, I just don't understand how this kept happening. Like, right. he already escaped once. You had an inmate been... telling you, hey... He's crawling up there. Yeah, he should have been and you're just lo- like, locked down way ah. harder. Yeah. Bundy was free, but he was on foot in the middle of a bitterly cold, snowy Colorado night. Yeah. Uh, he stole a broken down MG, but it stalled out in the mountains. 
Uh, Bundy was stuck on the side of Interstate 70 in the middle of the night in a blizzard, but another driver gave him a ride into Vail. Yikes. From there, he caught a bus to Denver and boarded the TWA 8.55 a.m. flight to Chicago. The Glenwoods Springs jail guards did not notice Bundy was gone until noon on December 31st, 1977. Was that the same day? 17 hours after he escaped. Oh, okay. Wasn't even a full day. I mean, yeah, still, but, but still. still a long time. But by which time they actually noticed, he was already back in Chicago. Oh, yeah. No, he's gone. So That's so much time. Following his arrival in Chicago, Bundy then caught an Amtrak train to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he got a room at the YMCA. On January 2nd, 1978, he went to an Ann Arbor bar and watched the University of Washington Huskies, the team of his alma mater. Beat Michigan. Just watch the game. Yeah, just okay. casually. I was going to sit back and watch yeah. this college game. All right. He later stole a car in Ann Arbor, which he abandoned in Atlanta, Georgia, before boarding a bus for Tallahassee, Florida, where he arrived on January 8th, 1978. There, he rented a room at a boarding house under the alias of Chris Hagen and committed numerous petty crimes, including shoplifting, Stop. purse snatching, and auto theft. Stop it. He stole a student ID card that belonged to a Kenneth Misner and sent it away for copies of Misner's social security card and birth certificate. You can get that with a student ID? I guess back then you could. Apparently. All right. Everything is just so easy. So here's the thing that a lot of people say is that Bundy had the perfect serial killer face. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. he just looked like an average person. Right. So like he could literally change the slightest thing and look like a completely different person. Yeah. So, uh, after that, he grew a mustache and drew a fake mole on his right cheek uh, whenever he went out. But aside from that, he made no real attempt at a disguise. But <laughs> even then, people still didn't really notice it was him. I love that. Bundy tried to find work at a construction site, but when the personnel officer asked Bundy for his driver's license for identification, Bundy walked away. Uh, Immediate red flag right there. Just but, walks away. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was his only attempt at job hunting. One week after Bundy's arrival in Tallahassee, in the early hours of Super Bowl Sunday on January 15th, 1978, two and a half years of repressed homicidal violence erupted. Bundy entered the Florida State University Chi Omega sorority house at approximately 3 a.m. and killed two sleeping women, Lisa Levy and Margaret Bowman. Mm -hmm. Bundy bludgeoned and strangled uh, Levy and Bowman. He also sexually assaulted Levy. He also bludgeoned two other Chi Omegas, Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner. The entire episode took no more than half an hour. Oh, my God. After leaving the Chi Omega house, Bundy broke into another house a few blocks away, clubbing and severely injuring Florida State University student Cheryl Thomas. That's so sad. It's such a violent... It's so violent. Bludgeoning is like... There's faster there's ways to kill that. people. Yeah. It's... Did he ever... Okay. No, I guess we'll get to it later. On February 9th, 1978, Bundy traveled to Lake City, Florida. While there, he abducted, raped, and murdered 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, throwing her body under a small pig wow. shed. A pig shed? A pig shed. And on February 12th, 1978, Bundy stole yet another Volkswagen Beetle and left Tallahassee for you gotta good. You got to get something else. Right. Why another Beetle? I guess he's, he's so smart, but he's so stupid. He's smart, but stupid. I don't get it. And he headed west across the Florida panhandle. Mm -hmm. That's so sad. She was only 12. Yeah. On February 15th, 1978, shortly after 1 a.m., Bundy was stopped by Pensacola police officer David Lee. When the officer called in to check of the license plate, the vehicle came up as stolen. Bundy then scuffled with the officer before he was finally subdued. As Lee took the unknown suspect to jail, Bundy said, quote, I wish you had killed me. Really? At his booking, Bundy gave the police the name Ken Misner and presented stolen identification for Misner. Mm. But the Florida Department of Law Enforcement made a positive fingerprint identification <laughs> earlier the next they day. They were like, oh. <laughs> he was immediately I'm glad they double checked. Oh, yeah. yeah. At least they did what they're supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> he was immediately transported to Tallahassee and subsequently charged with the Tallahassee and Lake City murders. Good. He was later taken to Miami to stand trial for the uh, Chi Omega murders. Mm -hmm. Now. Here's the funny part of how he got caught. It's horrific. It's it's horrific. It's horrific. Don't get me wrong, but it's just that a this wild way is what got him. Yeah, this is like yeah. put away for good. Bundy went to trial for the Kyle Mega murders in June 1979 with Dade County Circuit Court Judge Edward D. 
uh, Cowart presiding. Despite having five court-appointed lawyers, he insisted on acting as his own attorney and even cross-examined witnesses, including the police officer who had discovered Margaret Bowman's body. He was prosecuted by Assistant State Attorney Larry Simpson. Okay. Two pieces of evidence proved crucial. First, uh, Chi Omega member Nita Neary, uh, getting back to the house very late after a date, saw Bundy as he left and identified him in court. Uh, Second, during his homicidal frenzy, Bundy bit Lisa Levy and her left buttock, leaving obvious bite marks. So stupid. Police took plasters of Bundy's teeth, and a forensic expert matched them to the photographs of uh, Levy's wound. It's almost like he wanted to get caught. Right. For this, you know. And it was because of that that Bundy was actually convicted on all counts and sentenced to death. I actually have a picture of... uh, the forensics expert, Dr. Suverin, Suveron, uh, showing the comparison between the teeth and the plaster. So right here's him, oh, and wow. here's him holding up the plaster, and you can see the bite mark in the background. Wow. That he left. And then there's like his X-ray too. Mm-hmm. Looks like. So. It's so ch- it's. What a what a trial, for anybody there, the jurors, the prosecutor. Yeah. The person defending... No, he he didn't have a lawyer, did he? He was his own lawyer. He was his own lawyer. That's right. Well, that would so. have been a wild job. <laughs> and then this is actually Bundy when he was found guilty. Really? Was he <laughs> screaming? Yeah. Oh. Why does he look... S- okay. So, yeah, that's... He looks sad, but, like... He looks sad, but I don't like, believe him like even yelling. a little bit, yeah. Um, You can find all of these what pictures and more. I'm not sure. But um, you can find all these pictures and more up on our Instagram, Facebook, as well as on our website, whatsleeppodcast.com. Yeah. So go check those out if you're interested in seeing kind of more in-depth looks into what we're talking about. Yeah. Adding some visual aspect to it. After confirming the sentence, the judge gave him the verdict. It is ordered that you be put to death by a current of electricity, that current be passed through your body until you are dead. Take care of yourself, young man. Oh. I say that to you sincerely. Take care of yourself, please. It is an utter tragedy for this court to see such a total waste of humanity as I've, as I've experienced in this courtroom. You're a bright young man. It's You'd not. have made a good lawyer, and I would have loved to have you practice in front of me. But you went another way, partner. That's disgusting. Take care of yourself. I don't feel any animosity toward you. I want you to know that. Once again, take care of yourself. That is disgusting. You that kind of goes to show kind of how much of a charismatic mm. person he right. was perceived to be right that even though he was being ordered to death for he the murders of lots of people brutal murders too like you literally one of the pieces of evidence is a picture and a plaster mold of his teeth because he bit a woman on the butt you know yeah after, after bludgeoning, her, bludgeoning to her to death like how do you look at that and then look to him and be like i hope you take care of yourself i would have loved to have you in my courtroom as right. a lawyer like are you kidding me like nah fam get get out you're you're what? done immediate <laughs> bye that's disgusting so. bundy was tried for the kimberly leach murder in 1980 he was again convicted on all accounts principally uh, principally due to fibers found in his van that matched uh, leach's clothing and an eyewitness that saw him leading leach away from the school mm-hmm. and again sentenced to death during the Kimberly Leach trial, Bundy married former co-worker Carol Ann Boone in the courtroom while questioning her on the stand. I remember, I think that was in that Zac Efron movie. Pretty sure. Yeah, it was. So, that's really weird. You're on trial for murder and you propose. Yeah. Because um, uh, she didn't believe that he was Yeah. Guilty, I mean, a lot of right? people thought he was completely innocent. Just right. He was such a charismatic person. I mean, even, you know, even if they did believe that he was guilty, they're you know for some reason people fall in love with serial killers and people who are in prison for horrific things such as ted bundy and like i don't know i don't get it yeah i don't get it following numerous uh conjugal visits between bundy and his new wife boone gave birth to a daughter in october of 1982 however in 1986 boone moved back to washington and never returned to florida her whereabouts and those of bundy's daughter are unknown i wonder if she changed her name I mean, more than likely. Yeah. While awaiting execution in Stark Prison, Bundy was housed in the cell next to fellow serial kill- killer Otis Toole, the murderer we of Adam Walsh. 
Oh, okay. I was like, he, he's familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, FBI profiler Robert K. Uh, Ressler uh, met with him there as part of his work interviewing serial killers, but found Bundy uncooperative and manipulative, yep. willing to speak only in the third person and only in hypothetical terms. Writing in 1992, Ressler spoke of his impression of Bundy in comparison to his reviews of other serial killers. Quote, this guy was an animal, and it amazed me that the media seemed unable to understand that. Really? Yeah. I mean, I get it. with the judge. Yeah, I get it. I mean, yeah, he even fooled the judge Yeah. to have sympathy for him. Exactly. Uh, during the same period, Bundy was often visited by Special Agent William Hagmeyer of the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Behavioral Sciences Unit. Mm, we love that. Bundy would come to confide in Hagmeyer, going so far as to call him his best friend. <laughs> Eventually, Bundy confessed to Hagmeyer many details of the murders that had, until then, been unknown or unconfirmed. Mm-hmm. In October 1984, Bundy contacted former King County homicide detective Bob Keppel and offered to assist in the ongoing search for the Green River Killer by providing his own insights and analysis. Keppel and Green River Task Force detective Dave uh, Reichert traveled to Florida's death row to interview Bundy. Both detectives later stated that these interviews were of little actual help in the investigation. They provided far greater insight into Bundy's own mind, however, when primarily pursued in the hope of learning the details of unsolved murders, which Bundy was suspected of committing. Yeah. Did they ever verify any of those? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Here's his mugshot. Yeah. He looks so different in every single picture. That's it. He had, know? like, the perfect serial killer yeah. face. It's crazy. Like, there he looks like he's got, like, bushy curly hair, you know, like, it's just such a stark contrast from, like, the lineup, which... I mean, I'm sure it was, you know, a couple years later, but yeah. still scary. <laughs> Bundy contacted Keppel again in 1988. At that point, his appeals were exhausted. Bundy had beaten previous death warrants for March 4th, 1986, July 2nd, 1986, and November 18th, 1986. With execution imminent, Bundy confessed to eight official unsolved murders in Washington state for which he was the prime suspect. Right. Bundy told Keppel that there were actually five bodies left on Taylor Mountain, not four as they had originally thought. Bundy confessed in detail to the murder of Georgian Hawkins, describing how he lured her to his car, clubbed her with a tire iron that he had stashed on the ground under his car, and drove away with her in the car with him and later raped and strangled her. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> After the interview, Keppel reported that he had been shocked in speaking with Bundy and that he was the kind of man who was, quote, born to kill. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Keppel also um. stated that uh, he described the Issaquoia crime scene where Janice Ott, uh, Denise Nasland, and George Ann Hawkins had been left, and it was almost mm -hmm. like he was just there. Yeah. Like he was seeing everything. He was infatuated with the idea because he spent so much time there. He was just totally consumed with murder he, all the time. Yeah, you know, he returned to a lot of them often for disgusting things, but... Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, so I'm sure, I mean, even if he didn't, you know, a lot of serial killers can, like very easily remember lots of really stupid details like the ceiling was blue but the walls were red because like it's burned into their brain because i mean killing somebody is such a big thing to do but also they love to do it so they're gonna remember everything about oh, yeah. it you know Ugh. so as you mentioned pre in the previous episode when uh or before i don't know you mentioned previously talking about like when he confessed to a murder like minutes before his actual execution you're talking about like how he was hoping mm -hmm. to kind of yeah. prolong it yeah pretty much why he was confessing to okay, all of these that's what i figured um he was kind of just hoping that he could use the revelations and partial confessions to get another stay of execution right. or even like commute his sentence right. uh to like life imprisonment uh, at one point a legal advocate working for bundy asked many of the families of the victims to fax letters to florida governor robert martinez and ask for mercy for bundy in order to find out where the remains of their loved ones were yeah so that's kind of messed up yeah um, it's that power. But here's the thing. Every single family refused. Really? Not a single one agreed to do that. I mean, I get it, but, like, I I would still want to know where my loved ones were, you know? it it It's... To be honest, I, I've, I mean, knowing that they're already dead, I would rather, you know, not know where the body is than have the murderer be free. Well, not, well, not free, free, but, but you know. So, like, the, with the whole... The death penalty is so hard because, like, I want people to rot in prison for what they've done. 
like an execution such an easy way out but if they have to live in prison like that's not a fun life you know i mean certain places jail can be fun such as the um canadian jail that what's his name he killed cats and then people oh luca magnata luca magnata is living you know how I, you know how i remember life. that name now yes <laughs> I was literally Eagles going. Through, are ruining my life. I was literally going through the lyrics in my head. <laughs> and I was a horrible person. I hate him. Um, but yeah, he's he's having a great life. Like the documentary on him on Netflix was. Describing. Don't fuck with cats, by the way. If you haven't seen that, yeah, such a good one. The name of it is don't, don't fuck with cats on Netflix, and I mean it goes through everything. But at the very end of it, they will talk about like. Like, he's getting his, like, computer access and things, and he's got, like, an Instagram or something, and he, you know, it's it's not a hard life for him. He gets presents, like, nice robes and stuff like that. Yeah, doesn't he wear, like, Versace robes in prison? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Stuff so, like, like it, it's, it's hard for me to want them to be executed because I want them to rot in prison, but sometimes, even in prison, they're still treated better, Yeah, you know? So, I don't know a fine line there i wish we would have kept ted alive because i mean case study purposes um and also rotting in prison but it is what it is i guess it's way too late for that yeah keppel and others reported that bundy gave scant details about his crimes during his confessions and promised to reveal more in other uh, body dump sites if he were given more time Mm -hmm. the ploy failed and bundy was executed on schedule the night before Bundy was executed, he gave a television interview to James Dobson, head of the uh, evangelical Christian organization Focus of the Family, or Focus on the Family. Mm-hmm. During the interview, Bundy made repeated claims as to the pornographic roots of his crimes. He stated that while pornography did not cause him to commit murder, the consumption of violent pornography helped shape and mold his violence into behavior too terrible to describe. He alleged that he felt that violence in the media, quote, particularly sexualized violence, sent boys down the road to being Ted Bundy's. Um, no. I think that's all psychological. Now, in the same interview, Bundy stated, quote, you are going to kill me and that will protect society from me. But out there are many, many more people who are addicted to pornography and you are doing nothing about that. It's not a problem until you start killing people. And that's, that's he's, something... I feel like he's just... He's passing he's the blame. He's trying to he's pass the blame yeah. and essentially try to take eyes off of him. It just doesn't work. Which sir. It didn't work it, at all. It, it, that's not how it works. <laughs> so, according to Hagmeyer, Bundy actually contemplated suicide in the days leading up to his execution, but eventually decided against it. Mm-hmm. At 7.06 local time on January 24th, 1989, Ted Bundy was executed in the electric chair at Florida State Prison in Stark, Florida. His last words were, quote, I'd like you to give my love to my family and friends. Then more than 2,000 volts were applied across his body for less than two minutes. Wow. He was pronounced dead at 7.16 a.m. Several hundred people were gathered outside the prison and cheered when they saw the signal that Bundy had been declared dead. Mm-hmm. Now, I actually have pictures of Ted Bundy after his execution. Really? As well as people celebrating his death. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> so... That's Here's such a actually a car outside painted on the back windshield saying fry fry Bundy fry. Wow. Here's Bundy after his execution mm-hmm. while he, after he was pronounced dead. Is he bald? Mhm. Well, like Chris, they shave your head oh. when you go to get uh electrocuted. So there's that and then here uh is the uh, sorority saying watch Ted fry see Ted die painted on the walls outside the fraternity house. Needless to say, people were right. excited yeah. to see him. Humans haven't changed, though, I feel like, because um, I think way back in the day when executions were very public, you know, being hanged and mm-hmm. things like that, people, that was like <laughs> pretty much like a fair back in the day, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I understand their like vigilantism, you know, watch him die, mm-hmm. but also I feel like a lot of them were just morbidly watching on, and I just, it's so weird. I don't think I would have gone. Yeah. You know? I don't know. I think it's kind of like a closure thing. But I also think the yeah. spectacle of it being on TV and it essentially weird. being a reality kind of TV it, show almost. It's weird. I feel like that kind of 
got the public excited about it yeah oddly enough yeah i mean Um, don't get me wrong you should absolutely celebrate the end of a reign of terror yeah but you know i would have just been happy for me the end of his terror reign would have been him going to prison like i don't care if he gets fried at that point i don't care if he rots in jail you know yeah but i don't know that's weird i just think it's weird (laughs) different times yeah so to kind of, I guess, send off this episode, we're going to go over his uh, MO as well as his pathology report, kind of go into more details about everything behind what he did. Pretty much everything behind yeah. what he did and his kind of common tactics and things that he would do to kind of lure his victims in and things like that. Yeah. So uh, Bundy had a fairly consistent MO. Uh, he would approach a potential victim in a public place, even in daylight or in a crowd as when he abducted Ott and Aslan at Lake Sammamish, or when he kidnapped Leech from her school. Uh, Bundy had various ways of gaining a victim's trust. Sometimes he would feign injury, wearing his arm in a sling or wearing a fake cast, as in the murders of Hawkins, Raincourt, Ott, and Aslan, and Cunningham. Mm -hmm. Other times, Bundy would impersonate an authority figure. He pretended to be a policeman when approaching Carol Durant. And the day before he killed Kimberly Leach, Bundy approached another young Florida girl pretending to be Richard Burton of the fire department, but left hurriedly after he uh, after her older brother arrived. Yeah. That's so scary. You can't trust anybody. Right. So as we as I kind of talked about a little bit before, uh, Bundy had like a remarkable advantage in that his facial features were attractive. Right. Um, yet not basic and attractive. Memorable. Yeah. Um, in later years, he would often be described as chameleon-like. It would look totally different by making only minor adjustments to his appearance. Right. You know, like growing a beard or changing his hairstyle. Yeah. Like the uh, Clark Kent effect. Yeah. Just throw on some glasses. <laughs> Who is this guy, you know? Draw a mole on your face. So all of Bundy's victims were white females, and most of them were of middle-class background. Almost all were between the ages of 15 and 25. Many were college students. In her book, Anne Roll notes that most of Bundy's victims had long, straight hair parted in the middle, mm. just like Stephanie Brooks. Didn't the Liz kind of look similar to them? Mm-hmm. Like his normal MO? Yeah. That's so scary. A little bit. Like, I guess you can have a type. I wonder what made her different. Like, I guess he needed a cover, you know? I don't know. <sighs> I don't know. Anne Roll speculates that Bundy's resentment towards his first girlfriend was a motivating factor in his string of murders. Mm, maybe however in a 1980 interview bundy dismissed this hypothesis saying quote uh they just fit the general criteria of being young and attractive too many people have bought this crap that all the girls were similar hair about the same color part in the middle but if you look at it almost everything was dissimilar physically they were almost all different uh i mean maybe they 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 all looked the same because like i mean mean, other other than like you know just the hair right i mean like physically with like their faces and stuff i mean there's still there's still similarities where you can be like well you did pick out brunette women who had i mean i feel like just the middle part was just a popular thing back then so that might have been just a coincidence but still you know i mean i'm sure there was similarities that not necessarily he looked for but that's what made them attractive to him yeah so yes Uh, maybe maybe you know he just kind of didn't see it that way he was yeah. just like oh this woman's attractive yeah but like he didn't necessarily recognize that they're attractive because blah blah, blah yeah. you know so i feel like yes and no like i'm i definitely feel he had a type but i don't think he specifically looked for that type yeah now his common thing he would do is after luring a victim to his car bundy would hit her in the head with a crowbar he had placed underneath his volkswagen or hidden inside of it mm-hmm uh, every recovered skull, except for that of Kimberly Leach, showed signs of blunt force trauma. Uh, every recovered body, except for that of Leach, showed signs of strangulation. Many mm. of Bundy's victims were transported a considerable distance from where they disappeared, as in the case of Kathy Parks, whom he drove more than 260 miles wow. from Oregon to Washington. That must have been terrifying for her. Uh, Bundy often would drink alcohol prior to finding a victim. Carol DeRanche testified to smelling alcohol on his breath. Mm-hmm. Hagmeyer stated that Bundy considered himself to be an amateur and impulsive killer in his early years and then moved into what he considered to be, quote, his prime or predator phase. Okay. 
Uh, Bundy stated that this phase began around the time of the Linda Healy murder, where he began seeking victims he considered to be equal to his skill as a murderer. All right. So I think that's why he kind of started doing it in more uh public settings. I mean... I think he was just testing himself. Yeah. I guess... I, I just think he's a pompous asshole. <laughs> that too. I mean, um, don't get me wrong. In in general, so sure. Yeah. <laughs> On death row, Bundy admitted to decapitating at least a dozen of his victims mm. with a hacksaw. He kept the severed heads later found on Taylor Mountain, uh, which were Rancourt, Parks, Ball, and Healy, in his room or apartment for some time before finally disposing of them. Mm-hmm. He That's confessed disgusting. to cremating Donna Manson's head in his girlfriend's fireplace. That's disgusting. Ugh. Some of the skulls of Bundy's victims were found with the front teeth broken out. Bundy also confessed to visiting his victims' bodies over and over again at the Taylor Mountain body dump site. <laughs> this is where it gets kind of gross. Uh, he stated that he would lie with them for hours, applying makeup to their corpses and having sex with their decomposing bodies until putrefaction forced him to abandon the remains. Well, here's here's the thing. Not long before his death, Bundy admitted to returning to the corpse of George Ann Hawkins for purposes of necrophilia. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. There's a lot of dead air. I just don't like it. <laughs> It's disgusting. I hate him. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, Bundy confessed to keeping other souvenirs of his crimes. The Utah police who searched Bundy's apartment in 1975 missed a collection of photographs that Bundy had hidden in the utility room. Photos that Bundy destroyed and returned home after being released on bail. His girlfriend Elizabeth once found a bag in his room filled with women's clothing. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was already suspicious of him, so yeah. uh, when- it, it doesn't surprise me that he was so brazen about it. When Bundy was confronted by law enforcement officers who stated that they believed the number of individuals he had murdered was 36, Bundy told them that they should add, or that they should, quote, add one digit to that and you'll have it. And Rule actually speculated this meant Bundy might have killed over 100 women. Yeah. Speaking to his lawyer, Polly Nelson, in 1988, uh, Bundy actually dismissed the 100 plus victims uh, speculation and said that the more common estimate is uh, of approximately 35 victims was accurate. Mm. So... Now we're going to kind of go into his pathology. Okay. And uh, in December of 1987, Bundy was examined for seven hours by Dorothy Otnow Lewis, a professor from New York University Medical Center. Uh, Lewis diagnosed Bundy as a manic depressive whose crimes usually occurred during his depressive episodes. Mm -hmm. To Lewis, Bundy described his childhood, especially his relationship with his maternal grandparents, Samuel and Eleanor Cowell. According to Bundy, grandfather Samuel Cowell was a deacon in his church. Along with the already established uh, description of his grandfather as a tyrannical bully, Bundy described him as a bigot who hated blacks, Italians, Catholics, and Jews. He further stated that his grandfather tortured animals, uh, beating the family dog and swinging neighborhood cats by their tails. I wonder if any of that was true. Uh, He also told Lewis how his grandfather kept a large collection of pornography in his greenhouse where, according to relatives, Bundy and a cousin would sneak to look at it for hours. Mm-hmm. Family members expressed skepticism over Luis's uh, uh, Jack Worthington story of Bundy's uh, parentage and noted that Samuel Cowell once flew into a violent rage when the subject of the boy's father came up. Really? Uh, Bundy described his grandmother as a timid and obedient wife who was sporadically taken to hospitals to undergo shock treatment for depression. Stop shocking people. (laughs) Doesn't worry. For therapy. Toward the end of her life, Bundy said she uh, became agoraphobic. Yeah. I mean, her brain was fried at that point. Yeah. I wouldn't want to leave either. Uh, Louise Bundy's younger sister, Julia, recalled a disturbing incident with her young nephew. After lying down in the Cowell's home for a nap, Julia woke to find herself surrounded by knives from the Cowell kitchen. Oh. Three-year-old Ted was standing by the bed smiling at her. Three-year-old Ted with knives. So that just reminds me of that scene from Suicide Squad where Joker is just like laying oh, down yeah, and with there's the like guns. all the knives and guns In and the stuff. Guns, yeah. Like that just seems like such a movie trope. Like just, that just doesn't sound like yeah. something a three-year-old I've, would do. I've noticed lately that like especially going into deep dives with murder cases and stuff that movies don't always exaggerate. You think finding your three-year-old having surrounded you with knives would be something from a movie, but it happened. 
fucking I wouldn't know life. what to do in that situation, honestly. I didn't either. It had been like, are you, what's going on, buddy? <laughs> All right. Time for the orphanage for you. you <laughs> the orphanage. <laughs> yeah. Not about that. Bundy used stolen credit cards to purchase more than 30 pairs of socks while on the run in Florida. Okay. He, he really was a socks. self-described foot fetishist. Ugh. It got worse. <laughs> it got <laughs> <Sorry>. worse. <laughs> I don't mean to kink shame anybody. I don't like feet. Why? I just... All right. <laughs> in the Dobson interview before his execution, Bundy said that violent pornography played a major role in his sex crimes. According to Bundy, as a young boy, he found outside the home again in the local grocery store. In a local drugstore, the soft core pornography that people called soft core. And from time to time, he would come across pornographic books of a harder nature. Mm. Bundy said, quote, it happened in stages gradually. My experience with pornography generally, but with pornography that deals on a violent level with sexuality, is once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction like other kinds of addictions, I would keep looking for more potent, more explicit, more graphic kinds of material. Just to get a higher high, basically, off yeah. of that. Ugh. Until you reach a point where the pornography only goes so far, you reach that jumping off point where you begin to wonder if maybe actually doing it would give that which is beyond just reading it or looking at it. In a letter written shortly before his escape from the Glenwood Springs jail, Bundy said, quote, I have known people who radiate vulnerability. Their facial expressions say, I am afraid of you. These people invite abuse. By mm -hmm. expecting to be hurt, do they subtly encourage it? No. They don't. <laughs> they really don't. And in a 1980 interview, speaking of a serial killer's justification of his actions, Bundy said, quote, so what's one less? What's one less person on the face of the planet? Somebody who probably didn't want to die, Teddy. Somebody with a family. Somebody with friends, a family. Friends, goals. Loved ones. You know, actually living a decent life and not right. murdering other people. Because it's not just one less person. When Florida... It's 35 less people. Here's the thing, though. This is where we're going to leave off. And it's kind of a dark thing. Okay. When Florida detectives asked Bundy to tell them where he had left Kimberly Leach's body for her family solace, Bundy allegedly said, quote, but I'm the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. They asked him where he left their, her body, mm -hmm. and he said, but I'm the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. So he was just pretty that, much That was like, his response. I'm not going to tell you. To them. Like, it's like, I'm not going to tell you because I don't care. That's the worst. He did, Yeah. That's one of those power things. I hate him. And that's Ted Bundy. I hate him. <laughs> the He's the Probably worst. the most famous murderer. In America, yeah. In America. Probably the world, honestly. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> if you're from another Either country, way, have you heard of Ted Bundy? Incredibly prolific. Incredibly prolific. I hate him a lot. I don't get any joy in reading about him. Yeah. <laughs> uh well, I really hope you guys enjoyed this case. Um, it's <laughs> definitely been a long time coming. Yes. Uh, lots here. of, just, just lots of research trying to find pictures and whatnot. There's mm -hmm. so much yeah. on this guy. We probably could go on for hours, honestly, with him. Yeah. Like, there's just a lot to this. Anyway, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, again, I really appreciate uh, you guys taking the time to listen to these episodes. We greatly appreciate that. Uh, we would also greatly appreciate it if you would please share our podcast to your friends, family, coworkers. Let them know. Let them know about us. Spread the word. We got more coming. We got lots more coming lots in the future. Coming. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we will go ahead and see you guys in the next episode. Bye. Bye. Oh, wait, actually. I forgot to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. One more thing. This is for you, Nikki. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye.